Coming up, how China is changing the world. There are a host of different places where the security world collides with, uh, with China's resource quest. Council on Foreign Relations senior fellows Elizabeth Economy and Michael Levy discuss Beijing's far-reaching search for resources. It's just ahead on Global Ethics Forum. Today our guests are Michael Levy and Liz Economy. They're both senior fellows at the Council on Foreign Relations. And Liz is also the director of Asia Studies, and Michael is the director of the program on energy, security, and climate. And together they have written an interesting new book entitled By All Means Necessary, How China's Resource Quest is Changing the World. In it, they talk about China's economic explosion and the need for China to pursue raw materials and just where this may take the country and what the consequences are for both China and for the world around us. It says often that you can't judge a book by looking at its cover, but oftentimes the title does reveal what's inside the book. So to state the obvious, by all means necessary, how China is changing the world, let me ask you, do you think China is in fact changing the world? Let me start by you know, taking the title by all means necessary, um, because what that really refers to is all the tools uh, that the Chinese government uh, has at its disposal uh, for going out to secure resources outside its own borders. Uh, for example, uh, sort of a special kind of presidential diplomacy. Uh, when President Xi Jinping travels to Africa, uh, he may travel with a number of government ministers as well as heads of state-owned enterprises and propose a vast array of trade, aid, and investment deals in a way that is really not like any other country. Uh, China also has at its disposal low-cost financing and low-cost labor uh, that it can export uh, to undertake a lot of the infrastructure projects that surround a lot of the resource uh, development uh, that it also wants to pursue. Uh, and of course, uh, there is the kind of uh, backroom deals uh, at which uh, Chinese often excel. Uh, and uh, we see that uh, you know, they do this on the home front, uh, and they do it when they uh, travel abroad as well. Uh, and so the same kind of uh, sort of laws and governance uh, that may limit the ability of U.S. companies to do these sorts of things, the Chinese don't necessarily have those same kinds of restrictions on them. Why don't I pick out the subtitle, How China's Resource Quest is Changing the World. And when you look at all these tools the Chinese can bring to bear, you're bound to see consequences across the board. And we see consequences for the economies where China invests, for governance structures, for political relationships, and for even the military and security underpinnings of the global resource trade. But for all the excitement you see on all of those fronts and all the great stories you can find, when it comes down to it, one of the most surprising things we saw was that it's China's simple demand uh, and the impact that that has through traditional trade uh, that may be changing the world in bigger ways than anything else. Chinese demand exploded over the last decade. The world was slow to catch up. That drove prices steadily higher for a host of different commodities. And regardless of whether China was trading with this or that producer of oil or iron ore or copper, the consequences for these countries' economies was enormous. Uh, the consequences for other consumers were huge too because they were paying higher prices as a result. And we've seen transformations uh, everywhere from Africa to Canada to the Middle East as a result of that very basic piece, that surging demand that China has brought to the world. Well, they also say that um, China, in this pursuit, they sometimes act very aggressive and far-reaching. Have you found that in your research to be true, that they're more aggressive than, say, American companies or other multinationals? I don't really know that they're more aggressive um, necessarily. I think. Um, frankly, what we've seen is you know, this very fast rise over the past 10 years of Chinese outward uh, expansion and search for resources as the Chinese economy has been growing you know, at a rate of 9 to 10% per year, right, until very recently, two years ago. Uh, it, it dropped a little bit. So I think there's this sense somehow that uh, they are everywhere and doing everything in ways that are very different from what uh, previous companies have done. Um, but I think with the exception of sort of the different tools that I uh, outlined at, uh, at the outset, um, I think, you know, we find that uh, Chinese companies, you know, behave in similar ways uh, in terms of bringing resources, you know, online into the global market, sometimes not so much. For example, soybeans different. 
you know, what they bring online for soybeans, they, they take home. Uh, but I do think that this sense of China, uh, you know, as this, you know, cookie monster of resources uh, is somewhat overblown. Uh, you know, we also discovered, I think, to, to our collective surprise, uh, that when you look, for example, at China's investment in land overseas, it is the third largest investor. It's not the first largest investor. The largest is Canada. The second is the United States. If you look at its investment in Africa, you know, it's the fourth largest investor, right? After, you know, the EU and the United States, and I think Malaysia has now moved into third place. So, you know, again, the picture is much more nuanced, and we really need to look closely at what China is actually doing, rather than simply accepting a lot of the hype that has surrounded its activities. When you say you have to look at what they're actually doing, do you think they behave differently than other multinationals, like in Africa or in Latin America, in some ways? I think in the, in the governance um, areas, you know, when we're talking about things like the environment uh, or labor or uh, sort of corruption issues, transparency, uh, certainly we see some differences. And I think the easiest way to understand it is simply to look at the way that uh, Chinese officials and Chinese businesses behave at home, uh, because that's pretty much the way they behave when they go abroad. So if they're not undertaking environmental impact assessments at home, which oftentimes they don't, they're not doing them in Zambia, you know, or sometimes they are, but, but not as often as uh, they might. So this um, leaves a trail of corruption and violations, which they... A absolutely. I mean, I think you can look, and it's not just Africa, and I think that's also important in our book, that this is not all about China and Africa. That story has been exhaustively, I think, explored. But it's also China, Latin America, Southeast Asia, and we even looked at the United States, Canada, and Australia to get a different you know, set of comparisons to understand, does China behave differently uh, in the advanced industrialized countries uh, from the developing countries? I have to throw in a very short uh, bit about Zambia and environmental impact assessments. I visited Zambia when we were working on this book, and someone told me about a Chinese company that had submitted an environmental impact assessment in Chinese, and it was approved despite the fact that no one in the environment ministry in Zambia spoke Chinese. Uh, in one of the, the beliefs that's out there when it comes to how Chinese companies approach investment is that they're directed by the state, that they're called up and told, you do this, that, and the other. Now, occasionally, they are called up and told, you do this, that, and the other. Sometimes they listen. Sometimes they don't. But the more powerful direction that comes from the state comes through a set of incentives that is set up that encourages them more broadly. So a uh, policy decision can be made to provide lower cost financing. And Liz talked about that uh, early on. Uh, if you're investing in priority areas, uh, once you do that, you don't need to tell a CEO to go after this particular resource. Their desire to turn a profit in will direct them toward the places where they can do better because of that financing edge. Uh, you don't need to tell a CEO who aspires to be promoted to a minister post in the government. Remember, these are people who are part of a political system that while they're out trying to make their profit, they should also be trying to rack up gains on the fronts that top Chinese political leaders are saying are priorities. And so these are the more subtle ways that the Chinese state influences behaviors of these companies, but I think they're frequently the more powerful ones. Just to change directions a little bit, you have a substantial section in your book devoted to security consequences, such as the need to secure shipping lines and trade routes and pipelines. Could you talk a little bit about that, other than you know the tensions that we've seen you know, in the East China Sea between China and Japan? What do you see as other flashpoints? So there are a host of different places where the security world collides with, the, with China's resource quest. And one of the ones that we talk about a lot is the impact that China's pursuit of resources has on its behavior in multilateral diplomacy uh, around some big global security challenges. So take, for example, efforts to put sanctions on Iran in order to get it to uh, stand down or slow down its nuclear program. Uh, one of the big worries that the West had when putting sanctions not on the Iranian oil sales but on investment in Iranian oil and gas was that the Chinese would just come in and take over where any Western firm had exited. And the Chinese certainly had the desire to do that in several cases. But we've learned a few things from the experience. Uh, first, even where China has wanted to step in, there have been a lot of cases where, because they didn't have the right access to Western technology or Western partners, they couldn't actually substitute effectively. 
So uh, the technical capacity often still lies in the West, which constrains China's ability. Uh, and even if they want to do something, they can't necessarily execute. Uh, that, that drills home a broader point, which is uh, we should be looking at least as much at their capabilities as their intentions if we want to know what's going to happen uh, in the world. Uh, another data point uh, with Iran. During some of the discussions uh, about China possibly stepping in and replacing Western companies in Iran, uh, there were also Chinese companies that wanted to come invest in the United States in U.S. resource development. And while we, in theory, have an open policy toward foreign investment, I mean, there's very little question that signals were sent to these Chinese companies and to the Chinese government that uh, their attempts to invest in the United States might be looked upon less favorably if they were also stepping in and investing in Iran. And so they need to ask themselves not just a question about global strategy, but a question about their bottom line. Uh, what was more important to their futures as companies investing in a cutting edge technological opportunity in the United States or in these particular fields in Iran? And again, you can't nail this down. This isn't uh, conducted all in the open. But uh, there are a lot of uh, signs and a lot of stories that this influenced Chinese companies to choose to invest in the United States rather than go into Iran and undermine uh, the sanctions. So this is one place where we see, yes, there's the potential for China to uh, undermine some of the global security architecture. Uh, but in reality, it turns out the West has more leverage than we sometimes think. But also when um, they were investing in the Sudanese oil fields too, and then the rebels started attacking, that had to bring China into Sudanese politics, which, I mean, do you want to say something about that? Right, it, it did. That was part of what brought them into, uh, into Sudanese politics. The pressure from the West certainly uh, was a big part of that uh, as well. And frankly, the Chinese population, uh, the public, has become much more concerned uh, about the Chinese government's ability to protect its people abroad. And this is a, a new, frankly, a new pressure uh, that Beijing and the state-owned enterprises are facing, is the demand from the Chinese people that the government keep the people overseas safe. And this was an issue in Sudan, became an issue in Libya, exactly. And so I think uh, there are all sorts of pressures now uh, it, you know, being exerted on the Chinese government uh, that say, you know what, there, you have this traditional mantra of we don't mix business with politics, but you know, even on the face of it, that, of course, is not true. Uh, but now we're seeing the Chinese people themselves say, this is not acceptable to us. And do you think that will, in some way, um, lessen their interest or their pursuit in going further abroad? Will they think twice about it before they go now? With it's at a transition phase. Um, I don't know that we get the inflection yeah. point. I, I think there's a lot of discussion and debate within Chinese society and you know, certainly in academic circles, and I'm sure policy circles as well. But I don't think a determination has been made that they're going to change their policy. In fact, the most recent statement from President Xi Jinping is very much along the lines of, we don't mix business with politics. We also need to remember that the opportunities for China to go in, particularly alone, are often in these places that are screwed up, for lack of a better term, precisely because they're screwed up. I think we conflate two kinds of risks. Of risk. When you look at Sudan, this seems like the Wild West. This is pioneering. It's actually not pioneering when it comes to oil exploration. This is a place that was extensively uh, worked in by Western firms that got out because it just was an untenable situation. So China came in. They took a big political risk and a big security risk. They weren't taking big technical uh, risks. And, and at some level, they weren't taking enormous business risks. Uh, and so they were able to come in despite their relatively low level of technical capacity and put reserves on their books and produce oil and really deliver on their big goals. And despite the fact that these companies are improving, they're learning, uh, there are still a limited set of places where they are the most powerful bidder and where they can really come in by themselves uh, without anyone else and win. And often those are going to be places that are pretty sketchy. I just want to know if you um, were surprised by anything in your research. One thing that surprised me was um, that really China's rise and its uh, search for resources is not unprecedented. It's neither unprecedented in history, because you can look all the way back to ancient Athens and see that you know, it went out to secure resources from outside its own borders, and certainly up through the United States. And then Japan is our most recent example. Um, you know, even in the early 1970s, Japan commanded 10% of you know, global world oil uh, consumption. 
that is just about what China commands today. China is about 11 to 12 percent. You know, we really don't tend to think of think of it these kinds of parallels. Uh, and it's not unprecedented in terms of China's own history. Uh, so looking back, you know, at least as, as early as the Ming, but even before that, uh, you see that China had to look beyond its borders. Uh, sometimes it pushed to acquire land uh, from outside its borders because its own arable land was becoming degraded. Uh, you know, it had a very strong central government directed sense of uh, investment abroad. It controlled who could participate in the resource trade. It controlled where they went for the resources. It controlled how much money people could earn from the resource trade. And that same sense of sort of state-directed investment continues today, although I think one of the things we found is it's much more fragmented uh, than we anticipated. And that'll be my second point, which is that China really isn't the government, Beijing, is not quite the puppet master uh, that we assume. Um, and I think Mike alluded to this. Yes, it certainly exerts a degree of control over its state-owned enterprises uh, through its ability to, frankly, to remove the heads of the state-owned enterprises. I mean, these are people that if they don't do a good job in the eyes of Beijing, they can take them out, right? They can fire them, basically. Um, but there's also, you know, an enormous number of non-state actors, particularly in mining. You know, each one of these resources has a different makeup. Uh, the industry is made up differently. Uh, so two-thirds of the mining sector, you know, smaller scale industries, they're going out as well. You know, and in many instances, Beijing doesn't want them to be going out. You know, and having to deal with, for example, you know, four to 5,000 Chinese miners in Ghana, right, that the Ghanaian government just kicked out last July, you know, illegal Chinese miners. You know, Beijing doesn't want to have to deal with this kind of political problem. It shouldn't have been a surprise. Uh, in retrospect, but in a lot of places where you see very strong reactions to Chinese activity around natural resources, when you dig deep, it's actually other things that are driving the reaction. And, and because they're pursuing resources all over the place, it looks like one is, is uh, driving the other. So uh, you go to various places in Africa and you ask people about the resources, and, and they'll talk about that. But what they're really upset about is Chinese workers in the markets. Chinese workers on infrastructure projects, uh, all of the Chinese goods uh, coming in, all of these, and the, now that coincides with resource investment, but when push really comes to shove, it's that it's those other pieces that are really driving a lot of the, uh, of the concern. So one of the great things about co-authoring a book is that you don't only learn from your own reading and from going out around the world, you learn from your co-author. And one of the things I learned was about uh, how much is happening from civil society within China to actually influence uh, what, these what, what some of these companies are doing. And pressure from Chinese NGOs that go and, and look at what's happening around the world and then uh, try to put uh, social political pressure uh, on the companies back in China to, to perform better. Not the kind of thing you instinctively think about if you're not deeply immersed in China when you imagine how Chinese political and social change happens but a real reality in this space. I think you alluded tangentially on, on the tendency of the Chinese to bring in their own labor force in exploiting some of these natural resources. I continue to see little paragraphs once in a while that say that this, this labor problem with the Chinese and the indigenous population, especially in Africa, is difficult. Please comment on that. It is one of the things that stokes uh, the most sort of nationalism and sort of negative sense of the Chinese uh, resource quest is this sort of export of the Chinese labor. Um, but as he also mentioned, uh, oftentimes it's not actually focused on the resource itself, uh, but rather on the infrastructure or on you know, Chinese selling goods in the markets. It could be small scale Chinese farmers that are developing their plots to feed the newly growing uh, Chinese economy. Uh, but in some cases, it is, it is uh, in fact, uh, the Chinese labor in the Chinese mines. And so we've seen absolutely in Zambia, there's been several cases, in fact, of, of violence in different mines in Zambia. There have been problems in Peru uh, with violence, ongoing strikes uh, related to Chinese, other Chinese workers, Chinese managers, um, problems, workplace frictions, uh, you know, failure of uh, Chinese managers to be able to communicate simply. Frankly, they don't speak uh, the native language. They don't speak English. Uh, and their way of dealing with the local labor uh, is problematic. Um, some states with slightly stronger capacity, like Mongolia, for example, have uh, developed regulations that say if you want to bring in a Chinese miner, you have to hire nine 
Mongolian miners to make up for that. You know, I, I spoke with a, a quite senior uh, Mongolian official who said, you know, the Chinese are going to come whether we want them to or not, right? It's my job to figure out, you know, how to protect the Mongolian people. And so, you know, Mongolia's institute actually a range of different policies to try to limit uh, the number of Chinese uh, that come into Mongolia. So I think the labor issue is a very significant one, particularly just in, in terms of that nationalistic response um, and the sense that, you know, these are valuable jobs in a lot of these communities. And people don't anticipate that when the Chinese announce a major new investment, that the jobs are then going to go to the Chinese themselves. So I think, I think that's a part of the problem. And I would last point I'll make is that, especially early on, um, the Chinese used to build into their contracts. Uh, you know, they would say, for example, in Angola, for the infrastructure part, they'd say, you know, 70% of the labor needs to be Chinese. So we're loaning you the money, but by the way, the machinery and the people and everything else are going to be Chinese. Um, I think that's going to change as the capacity of the host of the resource-rich countries increases. We haven't talked about urbanization, that the Chinese are going to move two or three hundred million people into cities in the coming years. That's going to have a huge impact on their consumption of, of materials from around the world. Um, so on the urbanization question, it's a, it's a really interesting one um, because I think there's this natural assumption as we talk about China's rebalancing of its economy, moving away from a, an investment-led to a consumption-based economy, of which urbanization is an important part, right? The development of this large, much larger middle class um, urban-based, uh, there's this sort of assumption that, in fact, that's going to be a much less resource-intensive uh, kind of world in China. But in fact, it's going to be just a different kind of resource-intensive world. So first off, moving another three to 400 million, I think, uh, people uh, will require continued investment in infrastructure, right? Because they have not built up all the cities that they need or the highways or the, you know, railroads uh, that they need to service all of these new cities. Um, so I think that's one thing we have to bear in mind is that we're basically talking about urbanizing the entire population of China that's already been urbanized, right? We're doubling the urban population of China at this point. Um, so I think that's pretty significant. I think the second part is, you know, urban residents in China use three to four times more energy than rural residents do. Now maybe they, use, they can use it differently, right? They can use, the energy mix will be different. Um, but when we're looking at, you know, cars, you know, China sold more cars last year than the United States did. Um, that's going to be a lot more oil demand unless they actually make a breakthrough with electric or, or, or hybrid, which they've yet to do. So I think it's going to be important for us as we think about China's resource quest probably to look almost commodity by commodity, right, at, at what that impact is going to be. And of course, everybody talks about the impact on food. Uh, you know, as incomes rise and, you know, China becomes meat, more meat consumption based, et cetera. So I think it will have a profound impact. I'm not sure we've fully uh, sort of laid out exactly what that impact is likely to be. And a lot of it is going to have to do with the other choices that China makes with regard to its economy. You know, does it begin to conserve its resources, right? Does it begin to use energy more efficiently? It's made some strides. Is it really going to move forward aggressively? Is it going to have more renewables? So I think a lot of other choices that China makes in terms of its future you know, economic development path are also going to influence that resource use. If we take the title of your book and some of the things that have happened recently with the nine dotted line claim, the Japanese, et cetera, if the economic plays that you've been talking about cease to work and our relationship with Japan and the Philippines do we have a military component that's going to start to move into this area? You know, the rebalance to Asia <laughs> is, was first and foremost just that, right? It, it sort of expanded to encompass the Trans-Pacific Partnership and other issues of good governance, and the U.S. is going to help with the Mekong River and other kinds of issues. Um, but it really was, frankly, primarily a response to the concerns of the region uh, about sort of Chinese, rising Chinese assertiveness on the military front, right, in the security front. And so the U.S. response was to begin with a military one. It was, you know, the rotation of more troops through, you know, in Australia. Uh, you know, there's been a pretty dramatic ramping up, not only in terms of U.S. multilateral exercises and, you know, talk of, you know, the importance of the security alliance and treaty with uh, Japan, uh, but also security relationships among the countries in the region. I think that's one of the most important and potentially under-examined 
uh, aspects of, of what's happened in terms of China's rise in the region is that the other nations in the region, you know, Vietnam, India, and Japan, undertake their own you know, military cooperation, training, and exercises. Australia gets involved with them. There's a whole new dimension uh, that's emerging that in some ways is not completely dependent then on the United States, although we clearly are the most dominant force. Uh, but I think certainly that's ever present uh, in this discussion. The only thing I'd add is that to the extent that people think of this rebalancing or pivot or, or whatever it is as a move from the Middle East to Asia, the resource lens suggests that that is an unwise tack to take. Uh, if one of the, the big concerns of American allies and friends in the region is access to stable resources and particularly to stable energy supplies, uh, leaving something of an American vacuum in the Middle East to be eventually filled by China as it gains capability certainly would not accomplish that end. Uh, so even though the focus is on security in Asia, the security needs of Asia extend well beyond the immediate region. I thank you both for really giving us a wonderful discussion on these issues. Thank you. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.